the way children have been groomed has been the same for centuries, but the tactics around that exploitation have changed. It's very normalised that girls should be sex sexualised and like sent around. This is a generation that has been born into the internet age. The boys that are in gangs and then they have like girlfriends, the girls will like do a lot of bad stuff for them just because they're in love with them. He had me selling his drugs for him. And I think I was about 12, they give me stuff to hold. I looked in the bag and it was a gun. That there was when they were grooming me for other stuff. You've got people in one ear telling you to do it and then you've got other people in another ear telling you that it's wrong. It was exploitation and it was grooming. When girls are being sexually exploited within gangs, there's a level of humiliation that goes with that that people don't understand. And it's just terrifying. I still dream about the victims that I created. I just, I couldn't see a way out. Once they're involved, the purpose is to exploit, to make money, and it's ruthless. I just couldn't even look at myself anymore. I don't think I wanted to die. Um, I just wanted to be free of the pain. There's a higher percentage of males that are picked up in terms of criminal exploitation. There is an under-representation of females. The way that children are exploited has been the same for centuries. What's happening is largely because of technology. The tools that they have to undertake these tactics have increased. The thing about girls is, because they're hidden, we don't really know what's going on. So when understanding the structure of, of gangs, you've got your elders who are sort of out of the picture. No one really knows who they are. All the money gets sent there. That They're way out of the picture, you know, and they, they're usually older males. Then you've got olders controlling what we would class as street gangs. That's what we're talking about, street gangs. And the olders will run that. Your youngers are the ones that you're seeing getting killed on the streets. They're the ones that are out there, probably operating from a trap house. They're the ones that are feeding all the money up to the olders. And then you've got your runners. They're the ones that would take the drugs. They're just running it about. You've got your tinies who are children under the age of 10 because they can't be held criminally responsible for what they're doing. They've got quite a lot of power, the tinies, because obviously the olders have got a lot of use for them. And then you've got links usually girls that are there for sex. That's how it looks within a gang. If you want to do it very quickly, that's what it would look like. Females, females can obviously be at any position, I guess, but they're not gonna get much past the younger. If you think about it, like a management situation, there's this many olders and there's a whole lot of youngers all fighting to become olders. For a girl to progress in that situation is very rare. A girl could progress by being quite ruthless, I would imagine. They've just made everything like chefing and all of that mm. and it's not good and because I've had people my age singing about they've chef like free man mm. up. Because like if you don't talk about chefing, if you don't stab someone, uh, you're, you're like a meek. I say mainly from about 13 onwards. As the years went on I started hanging around with, a, with people that were a lot older than me. I was influenced on fighting, robbing. If if someone snitched, cool Aaliyah, Aaliyah will beat them up. Um, if someone did this, cool Aaliyah. You look over at my way or at my people and I'll come up and I'll knock you out. I enjoyed beating people up at one point in my life. So you want something held, I'm gonna hold it. You want something delivered, I'll take it. You want me to be in the car while you go and do something, I'll be there. My mum and my dad would argue all the time. My dad would beat my mum up. Um, we would get beaten. When we used to come home after school and the window would be open, we would know that daddy has his stuff and we would have a good evening. If the window was shut, we're not having a good evening, but we've known that like our whole life.
is we've always known. That's what daddy took for him to be happy, but also it made him very horrible. I was born into poverty and domestic abuse. There's no way around that. I was. The domestic abuse was taking place before my mum was pregnant, whilst, after. I, I was never the victim in terms of being hit, but it was always present. It was a very criminal household. There was always something going on. Uh, the domestic abuse ended uh, once my dad went to prison for the first time. But then that impacted on my mum's mental health. There was never a safe time. There was always something going on. There would be no food or no money quite a few occasions. Me and Paris, my sister, and we would literally cry ourselves to sleep together on top of my bunk bed. I often went to bed in, in pain because I was hungry. And then because of my mum's mental health, sometimes she couldn't work for ages. Sometimes she wouldn't work for five, she wouldn't even go out for five weeks. A lot of girls that have parents with mental health, they slip through the system because they're not usually naughty. And so you just get left. So that's what happened. There were social services at times, but for very short periods of time. The first time I remember getting drunk, um, I was eight. It was my dad's birthday. I was given by my dad and his friends champagne. I had so much alcohol, I was severely intoxicated. I got rushed to hospital to then find out that I had alcohol poisoning. After that, I'd just drink. I was drinking because I was depressed. I think I was hurting, I was hiding a lot of trauma. I was going through things that I never spoke about, things had happened. I was just not stable. I didn't feel safe. Um, I didn't have that umbrella. So home is not always a safe place for young people. Like if you think about the places where safe places should be, home, school, that's not always the case. I, I was failed by every professional around me, social services, the police, doctors, my, my parents, any professional around me failed me. They failed me by not listening to what I wasn't saying. They'd ask me direct questions like, are you scared of your dad? And I'd say no, but they never asked me how my mum got a black eye. So being hungry, having a parent with mental health, having things going on, it brings up some vulnerabilities that are there for you that can make you very open to exploitation. And so people that exploit, they don't go into any situation of exploitation winging it. And it starts with, you know, building relationships, forming relationships, starting to break them relationships down, exactly like domestic abuse. It doesn't always start bad. It's a very manipulative thought through way that gangs bring children, girls and young women, in, into the fold, if you like. But it isn't a fold, it, it's, it's a mask of exploitation. So my mum met someone, a friend of a friend, he started coming to my house and then his friend came. The first person that came, I just saw him as a normal person, he was just a friend. They, they show that they like you and then you like them. They ask you, can my friend come? Then that friend asks, if that friend comes, they come with another friend. They ask you, can you hold this for me, please? And I'll give you some money. They want you to hold drugs or they want you to hold weapons. Three floors of people selling drugs from my house and using my house as a trap house and a base for them to stay. And it becomes dangerous and unsafe. Our life was basically, it was just survival mode at that point. They are living in households where there is violence, where there is parental substance misuse, um, mental health that's undiagnosed. And these young people are trying to get away from that. That can be a big driver for pushing a, a young person into criminal activity. I properly got put into care when I was 12. As time went by, I was, I was going through my own mental health and I was running away, so there was quite a few occasions of rough sleeping. I'd get up in the morning, I'd put on my clothes, I'd probably go to bed in them clothes. That wasn't unusual for me at all. We didn't have shampoo in the house, so I was washing my hair with cold water and fairy washing up liquid. The area that I was going to, there was a group of young people, they were aged between 13 to 25, I don't know. They'd park their cars, they were always laughing, always, always busting jokes. It was just a vibe, like, 
you just wanted to be part of that and they befriended me they let me stand by them there's a lot of young people that are seeking for their emotional needs to be met maybe not feeling confident seeking that recognition from outsiders um, and whether that's out online or out in the community there was a girl um, so I was 11 12 maybe no, I was 11 she was about 16 she was just so beautiful and she had big curly hair so when the others were like maybe taking the mick out of me or saying unkind things about my clothes and stuff she'd be like oh allow it allow it allow it and so she was always very very kind over time what happens is that that child thinks that they're friends but there comes a point where that that gang member will call in the favor because all of that it's a thin veneer to get to get this this trust that can then be exploited and so there was a point where I've been partying with them for so long, I've been getting everything for free, I've been getting free everything, I've been getting everything. And yeah, I had to hold weapons or stuff like that. But there was a point when people start putting pressure on, the boys start putting pressure on, you know, you're, you're a 14, 13 year old girl. And by the age of 13, 14, these, these boys want to have sex. She told me how you don't have sex. And you just make sure there's other girls there that will. And so once I realised that if you brung them girls, that they wouldn't do stuff to you, and I, it's not a clear cut moment, but once you realise that, you make a conscious decision, you decide that's what you're going to do, life changes. You're protecting yourself. I'm pro by, do, by bringing other girls in, I'm protecting myself, or I think I am, I'm not, but at that moment, I feel like I'm protecting myself, but it brings out something in you that you can't understand until you've been there. You have to go now and befriend these, gig, these girls and look in their face and be like, oh, why you want to come a party? I come party, it's free, it's free, it's free. It's like, no matter how much you like them, when my man says that he chose that one, you have to go and tell that girl that's what time it is or they will rape you. There's only so many times that you can hear a lineup. A lineup is when man after man does what he wants with a girl in a room. It triggers something in you that is nothing covered than fear. Do you know how many times they told me they were going to rape my mum? These boys, like once I started rebelling a bit and I didn't want to do the stuff that they wanted me to do, they brought my mum into it, like... But it changes something in you. It, you know, for, for me personally, I can't speak for no one else. I, I, I have nightmares, like I, I have nightmares. I haven't had a full night's sleep in years. I still dream about the victims that I created or I dream about the things that I heard and I, and I saw. Um, some girls, like, they can be, like, sexually assaulted and, like, they don't want to be the snake, so they just stay quiet. I started self-harming, I think, the first time I... I went through, I went through a few things. This was when I was, like, 13 to 14. Um... And I had no way to get it out. I was drinking more, I was running away more. Um, I, I was having breakdowns, but silent breakdowns where there was no tears. I'd try and, like, I'd just go out and I'd get drunk. And I know that once I get drunk, I'll black out because I won't feel it. Like, because I didn't want to die. I don't think I wanted to die. Um, I just wanted to be free of the pain. Um, yeah, so it's like it got worse and then there was the last time where I took an overdose and then they told me that day that I wouldn't be able to have kids because of the damage it done to me and that was the last time I ever harmed myself. So it was years, like a good like two, three years like of hurting myself. And even if I didn't want to, because sometimes I didn't want to do that to myself, because I didn't want people to see the marks, I'd hurt someone else. Because of what I went through, the things that I didn't deserve to go through is affecting me. I'm now making it affect other people. That's just a vicious cycle. Um, and I was fighting my way out. I was punching my way out. Um, but it took a long way to get out of that. Once girls are in gangs or in any organised network, however entrenched or otherwise, they are vulnerable. They will be exploited. Doesn't matter if they're black or white, doesn't matter if they're 12 or 16. 
Doesn't matter if the dad and mum are rich, doesn't matter if the mum and dad are poor, doesn't matter if they're single parent families, it doesn't matter. Once they're involved, the purpose is to exploit, to make money, and it's ruthless. They do not care about these children. The scope of girls that are being exploited criminally and sexually is growing. For some, they are unaware that they are actually being exploited because models such as the boyfriend model are used on them where they do believe that they are in a romantic relationship with a partner. Um, what they don't realise is that partner is actually a perpetrator. When I was a teenager, I met a guy that was in his 20s. Um, we became in a relationship together. I sold his drugs. I couldn't tell that I was being exploited at that time because of what I went through. I could honestly slap myself in the face because I'm not stupid. But I was young and I was naive and I was very, very, very vulnerable. They are more likely to be looking for genuinely loving relationships. And so it's not difficult then for an older man involved in criminal networks to appear like that. You're hearing all the things that you want to hear. You get so lost in that world that you're not realising what's actually happening and what you're putting, getting yourself into or what this older person has got you into. Say if you're in a relationship and they keep asking for pictures and then you don't want to send them but you're scared they'll leave you or something and so you keep sending them and then once you get into like some argument or something they'll just send them around everywhere. So the way safeguarding um, is used, used to work mainly is around keeping the child safe from harm from within the home. However, things have changed. The addition of social media as a contextual factor. Victims in over 80% of online grooming offences are young girls. Grooming can start with something as simple as a friend request. On Snapchat, if you just add like random people and you don't know who they are, like if you get like mentioned or something, then they can just, they have no idea what you look like or who you are and they'll uh, still ask you for news because they know you're a girl. Like, I don't think it's a sense of like, whether you're pretty or like, you've got like, you're very developed. I think it's just like, more like a sense of power. Like, you feel like you can do that to someone. They've got direct access to your personal life. It's much easier to get to know you in a very short space of time. Um, and it's much more difficult for that girl or young person to then put those barriers up. It is very confusing because like you've got people in one ear telling you to do it and then you've got other people in, an other, in the other ear telling you that it's wrong and like gross to do it. So you, you're kind of like torn. It's really, really important that uh, young people are given the opportunity to understand uh, what is healthy sexual development, what is harmful sexual development, that they have an understanding of consent and when they can say no. Because you might have did what you did, but you might regret it or sometimes you can't tell someone because if they judge you for what you did. So then you just keep it to yourself. Because these things are happening a lot, they think it's just normal now. But it's not. And it's not. The answer is not to stop children from accessing the internet, because I don't think that would take away the harm. The answer is to make sure these sites think about what users use their platforms, who signs up and makes an account, what age are they, we need the legislation in place to, to make them take that action. Children's needs are changing, um, and that means that the way in which we work with them and the way in which we safeguard them needs to change as well. A lot of our safeguarding models are built on old, mod on old ways of working where social media didn't exist. We have to acknowledge that there's a gap in knowledge and we have to acknowledge that actually these young people and the girls that we are working with are the experts of their situation. Because I didn't know I was traumatised before. Um, and I think a bit of that still lies in me now. I know how to manage it a, a lot more than how I did before. I didn't know what was going on. Um, I didn't know I was depressed. I didn't know that I was becoming an alcoholic. Um, I didn't know that I was a bully. I stopped harming myself. I stopped hurting people. Where, that's where Bridges Lane comes into it. Memories just come back. 
like everything. Wow. That's where it all started. That's where it got better. It's different. Nine and a half years since I've lived here. I just turned 15. I arrived here with no trust. Angry. I was angry at the world. I was angry at myself. I was angry because I wanted my mum and I wanted my dad. And I got allocated my key worker, Rowena. I just needed, I needed a family unit. I just wanted to just cry and hug someone. Um, and I got to do that here. That, that house, that home, that home toned me down. It brought me, I wasn't lost no more. I needed someone to trust. Rowena became that person within that care home. And don't cry. <laughs> don't cry. You're crying already. I wish you'd. Oh, no. I really do. Oh, but don't cry. I mean, I don't know how I'm getting it in for as well. Don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. Yeah. I, I miss you doing that brown in the knees. <laughs> <It's> nice. <laughs> I don't look different. I love it. Okay. And your bedroom? Yeah, I remember I had two bedrooms. No, you had one, but you wanted to have two, but you had one. But I had stuff in the other one as well, mm -hmm. so it was two bedrooms. Because you refused to move. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Bridges Lane is where it all started. You need someone to believe in you. Yeah, that's it. But you made it work. Yeah, Marina believed in me 100%. Like oh, yeah. Did. Marina was in my corner. Tell me, but you were patient. You didn't, you didn't rush me. Thank you for being my arena. <laughs> <laughs> that name. No one could ever say my name properly. My arena's like you've never left. Like you've always been there. I, I don't think I could ever not know you. Like ever. Don't cry. Um, <laughs> don't cry. It's annoying. Because I never let no one get up close and personal with me. Like ever. And Rowena just got into me somehow, I don't know. By but fire or by broke, force. <laughs> she just broke into me. Like, no, like, it's, it's been a journey. And yeah. this has been the best journey ever. Like, just just here. Like, just the family things as well. Either way, we was going to be a family whether you liked it or not. And we were going to eat and we were going to have breakfast on Saturdays. And, and we, we all ate together. Yeah, we yeah, we, we did. Didn't even, and I think that's one rule that I didn't break. I didn't go up to my room with food. You had no choice. <laughs> <laughs> you wasn't going upstairs. The community is really important to remind, to remind girls that there is hope at the other end of the tunnel um, because that encouragement and that source of support um, is really important in boosting how these girls view themselves. You know, there are lots of examples of girls who've been in these situations who have come out of it, you know, and are fantastic role models. And there's nothing to stop any of these girls from becoming that. I think it will happen and it needs to happen sooner than it already is. But the fact that we're having these conversations now um, is a step in the right direction. Well, we weren't hearing the voice of the survivor. What every girl needs is they need people to not give up on them. It isn't all lost, it isn't all bad. It's about understanding the trauma you went through and turning that into something so you can push forward and so that you're not forgotten anymore. I was written off completely. I was that kid that you didn't want your kids to sit next to. I've gone on to achieve, I've got my own company, I'm educated, but I ain't forgot where I've come from. And what I do is make sure that I can do anything in my power to make that sure that other girls feel the same way. I used to care about my friends more than myself, so like, but now as you get older, you mature. You shouldn't try to change yourself for anyone, no matter what anyone says about you or thinks about you. You can't get better than what you've already got. It was hard. I had, uh, I had my ups and downs, but it started to pick back up again. Um, I met someone, then I found out I was pregnant 
and she is my saviour and I thank the Lord every day for that and for her and for my life but I'm still on a journey my daughter is in my care I'm a mum I'm a mummy I'm a mother I've got a home not a house I work and I'm happy um, I've, my community in the area that I live in is smiles every day. Hello, hi, hi, hi. That was never me. And I'm in a better place. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> I was trying so hard. Yeah. <laughs> I'm all right. <laughs>